Yo, it's the Sauce Kid Official, man. I'm rocking my man Nick at Hard Knock TV. Keep it locked, you heard? First of all, congrats on the number one rap album. Thank you, I appreciate it. I know uh, you've been putting in a lot of work, putting out a lot of music, so it's gotta feel good. I know you've done a little bit of the radio runs for this album, so I see the Drake questions and the hairline questions, all that. I don't wanna do any of that. So I, I wanna have an interview where we actually get to see the person behind Tory Lanez, like who you are as a human being, because I feel like everybody's talked about the headlines. That's cool. But I want to know like who you are. So shoot away. If you uh, you'll take this journey with me, let's go back a little bit. Uh, if there was a movie made about your life, the intro sequence is coming through your hometown. It's coming into your home. What are we seeing? What are we hearing? What are we smelling? My hometown. You're seeing Toronto. You're seeing the CN Tower. You're seeing the whole you know the whole skyline open up. They flying in from the Gardner. Um, and honestly. You're, you're seeing a lot of different culture. You're seeing people from the Arab Emirates, you're seeing Asians, you're seeing Indians, you're seeing Africans, people from Trinidad, Guyana, all, all in one big melting pot. That's, that's kind of like, you know, Canada and Toronto, where I was born. What about in your personal home? What are, what are we seeing? In my home, um, my dad is a missionary preacher. Uh, my mom, when she was alive, she was also like a missionary preacher. She did the same thing as my dad. And um, that, that means that, you know, they, they traveled around the world. They weren't like stationary uh, preachers or anything like that. But they would travel around the world and speak and heal people and do all this crazy stuff. And um, I, it was six of us, same mom, same dad, uh, two sisters, four boys in total, so six. And the uh, house was pretty, uh, pretty full. <laughs> it was pretty full, but it was it was jam packed with a lot of character. Um, you know, everybody had different personalities, so it kind of shaped us all to be very, very different. What are the sounds that you're hearing at that time, like in your childhood? Is there like Caribbean music playing? Because I know your your parents. Nah, it's, I actually, I not nah, this time when I was younger, it was only like gospel music and stuff. Like my dad wouldn't let us listen to secular music, like. He was just like, we couldn't really listen to like what was on the radio and like, he wouldn't let me watch certain things. I couldn't go trick or treating and none of that stuff. Like, you feel me? Yep. Do you remember like your first musical memories? Like what are the ones that like stick out to you? I think like the first song I remember hearing is a melody that went zippity doo da, zippity day. My oh my, what a wonderful day. It was the first one I ever heard. Did you know I think that's like the first one that ever like stuck in my head that I was like very classic to me. How old were you at that time? I think I was probably like five or four. What was the moment where you were like, I think I want to rap or I think I want to do music for a living? How long um, did that take? Well, my mom died when I was 11 and when she died, I didn't really like know how to really express myself. So I was like type of person where the music, it, it was like a thing where I, it really started, like the way I actually started rapping, like the actual moment it happened was I was playing Madden against my cousin and I could swear on here. Yeah. So he was whooping my ass and it was killing me. And I remember like uh, just being so mad because I couldn't beat him. And I remember going into the garage and I remember just writing on this piece of paper, like oh, kill him and <laughs> all this stuff. And I remember like, I, I remember turning it into like a, a rhyme and then feeling a sort of freedom from uh, the expression of, 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 of making music. Because when my mom died, I was a very rebellious child. Very, very super rebellious. Like, I didn't, I, my outlook on authority, it just wasn't, it's like, you're not my mom, so you can't tell me what to do, mm. sort of thing, you know what I'm saying? And because of that, it was like, I always grew up, I wasn't like stupid, I was like really smart, but it's just my behavior was like, atrocious like it was just horrible like you feel me so because of that it created just this feeling of like of of in, in, like just enclosure like I just was very uh I wasn't introverted because I still you know talked to kids around me and I was very I was very social you know with, with with the kids that were around me but it just made me very like closed and then when I when I started you know writing on a paper Turn this, it was it just like everything kind of opened back up again and I was immediately able to, to get back into a place of like, all right, it's not so, it's not like all this depression in a ball, <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? 
yeah. so it's therapeutic in a way definitely it was wow. definitely therapeutic is that where the the lanes part of the the name comes from like i heard that it came from a friend of yours and it was because you were out in the street kind of like in between cars is that kind of that mentality of like i don't say reckless but it's just like the maybe not very, caring as much very or? reckless kid um you know it was very bad because uh you know like like i said you know my problems with like how i looked at things but like I was just, you know, I was just a mischievous kid. Like, you know, I did a lot of f funny stuff I probably shouldn't have been doing. And um, that's how I got the name was just like, like I would do stupid stuff, like just with my friends we'd playing, um, what's that game, Chicken? Yeah. You cross the road and the cars are coming. And that's really how I got the name Lanes, you know. Um, the Tory came from when I when I when I started ra rapping and I wanted to rap. I wanted people to call me Notorious, like Notorious B.I.G. But like the, the kids from my neighborhood were like, I'm calling you the Tories, you're not the IG. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So they 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 called me uh Tory for short for notorious. You know, and Tory and Lanes. Is yeah. Biggie your favorite rapper? Or no, at the time I I felt like that was the thing that you had to say. Biggie's my favorite rapper. But Biggie's is one of the is one of definitely one of the greats and is definitely in my top five. But I, Pac is really like like one of my favorite rappers. I feel like I, I, I relate to Pac, or I related to Pac a little bit more. Do you have a favorite Pac or Biggie line? Favorite Pac line? It's a lot of Pac lines, bro. It's a lot of Pac lines. It's really, honestly, I got favorite Pac records, but I can't, I can't pinpoint every line because there's so many things that he said that were so crazy, like, um, like, I like Only God Could Judge Me. That's like one of my favorite Pac records. Um, uh, Wonder Why They Called You Bitch. Um, you know, I'd Rather Be. Like those records, I'm not really, like I wasn't like super, super like crazed and craved out about the singles. I was more so about the inner music and the, the depth of it, you know? I am the, the, remember when he was like, yo, I'm gonna spark the brain? Like, yo, that's me. <laughs> I swear, yo. <laughs> I promise, like that's that's me. He said, "I'm, I'm gonna spark the brains and like, change the world." Yeah. He said, "I might not change the world, but I'm gonna spark the brain and change the world." <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, where were you in your life when you heard that? Do you remember? Um, I think I was in Canada, um, but the second time because I I was born in Canada, was there for a couple of years, and then I moved to Florida, which is where my mom died, and. That's like where a lot of the stuff in my life kind of happened. Florida, from Florida I moved up to Atlanta, from Atlanta I moved up to New York, and then from New York I moved back to Toronto when I was like 14, 15. So the second time I moved to Toronto, I think is when I actually went back and heard that quote. You know, it's crazy, like, I, 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 I listened to Tupac, you know, the songs and the singles, but I never really got into Tupac until I turned like 14, 15, and really understood what he was really talking about, and it was at that point, that I was like, yo, something special, you know, about him. And I felt like, like this is, this is the impact that I want to have, you know? There's something about Pac that I think when you're going through stuff, like I remember I, I, when I was in a really deep depressed spot for a while, uh, I had the third verse of Me Against the World written on my wall. To, to just kind of like help me. And you said around 14, 15, around 14 and 15, you actually were going through some stuff too, right? Definitely, tell, definitely. Tell, tell me a little bit about that, that time in your life. Uh, 14, 15, I was facing four court cases. Um, it's crazy, it was so long ago. But I was in high school and I had a weapons dangerous charge. I had a theft under charge. I had an, an extortion and robbery charge for, for nothing. I didn't even do anything. And just a whole other charge as well for a weapons dangerous or whatever, some other charge. And it was just like, for me at that time, I remember being so stressed at one point that I was just like, at one point I was like, I'm not even going to court no more. I just stopped going to court. But I was a juvenile, so it was like, it was a little bit like more lenient for a juvenile when you came back into court after you missed like a date or two dates, you know what I'm saying? So. It was like, it was a point where I was like, yo, these cases just keep piling up. I got a legal aid lawyer, my legal aid lawyer not doing nothing. You know what I'm saying? Every day I'm just going to court and they giving me another date and I'm just stuck in the system. And I was making music. 
I found a, um, I found a studio with this dude named Rhymes, and um, I stayed in his uh, his his aunt's basement, where where the studio was. It was like a room about the size of this room, probably where the couch is right here. And you know, I slept on the floor of that room every day, and it was hard floor like this, but it had a little carpet over it. But you know, the carpet that's like it's not carpet. It's like a it's like just like a padding, like you know what I'm saying? I used to sleep on the floor every day and wake up and record myself, had the booth in the closet, press record running the booth, press record running the booth, you know what I'm saying? Like 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 that's where I came from. Um and then, you know, taking those songs that I had, turning them into mixtapes, taking those mixtapes, I had to connect. Um, shout out Hassan, you know what I'm saying, up in Scarborough. He used to uh print my mixtapes, give me the slips. I used to go to all the, all the malls. Every every top security at that time of the malls knew me because they kicked me out their mall. And I kept coming back and I kept coming back and selling CDs and selling CDs. There's people right now to this day that still have the CD that I sold them. Winnie Harlow, do you see the model Winnie Harlow from, from Toronto? She got my first mixtape. I sold her my first mixtape. This is not a joke. <laughs> like, like she'll tell you like this is this is I was really out there you know, yo, let me rap for you, let me sing for you. That was my 14, 15, you know, what I was kind of going through at that time. The street life, I mean, it was a survival thing, right? At that point, you couldn't live with your grandma, like she, she like, told you to go do your thing. At that time, I was, look, I was 14 when that happened. And then, like, this time I'm talking about, I was probably like 15, 16, okay. like, like a year and a half after that. I was staying with these dudes. My grandma didn't let me live with her. Like, pretty much, we came from Atlanta at one point. It was me, my dad, my niece, and my stepmother. I hated her. And we, uh, you know, we drove up to Toronto, and my grandma, because the summer previous, I stayed with my grandma, and I was just like, like I told you, my attitude was just crazy. She was my grandmother, but, like, I didn't look at her like my mom. You know what I'm saying? So it was just, like, one of those things where I was just mad, like, disrespectful and just you know and so she was like yo he can't stay with me like she's talking to my dad she's like yo you can stay here you know your wife can stay here my niece Sarai she can stay here but he he can't stay here so I ended up staying with one of my brother's friends I didn't know these dudes at the time I, like I had supposedly met him when I was like a kid but like you know when you meet people as a kid it's like your brother's like yeah you knew this guy as a kid man you know it's like one of those ones like I didn't know him so um it was me uh, Old Dog, Rashawn, and Jamar. It's these three dudes that they were all brothers, and they were these dudes who, like, they they had like a real vengeance against their mom, cause their mom like did them dirty and like left them out in the cold on certain nights, and like they had to fend for themselves. So like they whole they whole upbringing was like, yo, fend for yourself. I was 14, moving into Canada. This is the first place I'm living, and this is the first time I'm actually living, you know. Uh, away from like family like you know because like my family was six six kids you know big household family but once my mom died everybody started splitting up people moved here this that third I was just the last one out and then I this was like when I I ended up kind of getting out so three dudes I'm in the house you know they go by certain rules but I'm not even used to like not sharing with like whoever's in the house I'm used to sharing so like, you know what I'm saying? I'm hungry, I go in the fridge to get something, but every, this this was the thing in the house. It's like, yo, if you touch something that wasn't yours, like you had to fight. You just, that was just what it was. Like you had to fight. And these guys were like, I was 14. These guys were like 18, 21, 24. You know what I'm saying? So you had to fight. Like, yo, so like from age 14, like I was just fighting niggas, like, I was just, I was just fighting mad niggas, like, you feel me? Like, but it wasn't even mad niggas, it's just these niggas, it's just like, I was just fighting these niggas, and it's just like, to me, it felt like I was fighting mad niggas, because these niggas was big, these guys was grown, you know what I'm saying? I ain't fully developed yet, I'm just out here, you know? And my thing is, it's like, one thing about me that I learned about myself at that time was like, all the built up anger, it gave me a lot of heart. And it gave me a lot of like, no matter, like there was this dude named Dre Day, and he used to come to the house. This big nigga Dre Day, like big, like he's always like a big, you know what I'm saying? And Dre Day used to come to the crib 
And I remember Dre Day used to just be, he used to be just mad about his own shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? He used to come to the crib mad about his own shit. He didn't even live there. There was three rooms in the house, one upstairs, or three upstairs, and that was for Rashawn, O-Dog, and Jamar. And I slept on the couch. And I remember, like, I'll never forget this shit. Like, he used to come to the crib, this dude, Dre Day, and, <laughs> and shot, like, it's, like, I don't feel this way no more. It's like that, like, we've got over this. Like, it's over, it's, it's okay, but whatever. But he used to come to the crib, like, yo, and it was me and my dude, uh, uh, Buck, and we would just be in the crib, and he would come to the crib and just bully us, like, not, not like, not like, not like you do even give you a wedgie. Like he was just like big and like yo, like you said anything, he was just gonna crunch you. Like you know what I'm saying? But like, Dre Day would come to the crib, say some shit to me. But I was always a kid. I wasn't backing down, so I was always saying some shit back. Like nigga, nigga fuck you, nigga. You know what I'm saying? And they bam, 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 just quick ones. Like, but the thing about it is, is like no matter how many times he hit me, I would never, I would never let him see me cry. I would never let him. Whatever it was like, I just wouldn't let him. You know what I'm saying? And like, I remember one. <laughs> I, remember, I remember like there was this infamous joke, cause he used to come to the crib, and like take me off the couch and be like, "Nigga, I'm sleeping on the couch." Like, and there was only this other small, tiny ass couch. It was that, and or it was like this mattress that they like pulled out of like some like closet that like every nigga fucked on, and like you know what I'm saying? It was just like you know what I'm saying, and that's where I had to sleep. Like you feel me? And I remember like I had to lay it down in the middle of the living room. And I remember like when everybody would go to sleep, when everyone was about to go to sleep, they'd make a little joke and Dre would be on the couch like, nigga, go to your room, nigga. And everybody would laugh, ah, 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 go to your room. Ah. And I'd be sitting there on, on the bed like, all right, promise y'all niggas, bruh. <laughs> like, I promise y'all niggas, bruh, like I'm gonna get out this shit, my nigga. And when I get out this shit, bruh, like nigga, nobody's gonna tell me to go to my room, nigga. So then I started fucking getting jobs, shit like that, you know what I'm saying? And at the same time, as much as they like, you know, fought me, and as much as I fought them over the, like the year or whatever the case is, how long I was over there, as much as I fought them, they taught me how to be a man. Like, Dre Day was the same person who was like, who taught me like, and this is like when I was young and just a ragamuffin, I ain't really know no better, like, taught me like, yo, my nigga, you always gotta, you know, have clean drawers, and you always gotta like, you know what I'm saying? There was a time I, I had no money for no boxes, nigga. I had boxes for like a week, and I remember like Dre Day took me to the Walmart. I never forget it. The same nigga who used to, you know, bully us, or whatever cases, he took me to Walmart, and he was like, yo, bro, I'm gonna do this for you once, bro, and from this point, you gotta do this for yourself, bro. You always gotta, he bought me all the shirts, the undershirts, and the, you know what I'm saying? So it's like the same time, like, it was still both ways, you get what I'm saying? I, I was raised by dudes who were going through their own problems. You know what I'm saying? And because of that, it taught me like a certain, like like you said, a certain survival instinct. Um, now, as I grew up a little bit more, I realized I like, maybe things didn't have to be as harsh as they were, but if they weren't as harsh as they were, I wouldn't exactly be like, you know, sitting here. I saw a story that said something about, there was a moment where I think you had just robbed somebody or, or something with somebody else and you kind of saw the other person and then you kind of like pulled back from it. You're like, I don't want to be doing this anymore. That was when I was facing the, the whole court uh, cases and the charges. And I mean, that, was, that literally was the day that I was like, yo, I'm not going back to court anymore. I'm tired of this shit. And I went to the mall and we did some shit, yeah. took some shit, and then we left. And then we went somewhere else, we took some more shit. And then in the nighttime, we went to go take some shit from this one kid. And I remember like, approaching him and it was just like yo what it was that actually what, what it was that was crazy was like the dude that I was with he he thought it was just like it was just like it was a lick day for him like you feel me but for me it was more so like we had came to rob this one last dude and I remember like his friend was with him and his friend ran off on him and just left him there like sort of like just left him there and I and it was something about like the disloyalty in it that just kind of took me back and then I looked at who, what I was doing and like if I was loyal to the person that I was actually like doing this with and that just kind of took me back and just like, yo, what am I doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, I just was one of those kids that was just like, yo, if they don't give me something, I'm gonna take something. Like, you feel me? And because of that, like, I had the wrong views on a lot of things, um, you know, growing up. But there's always like these moments where God shows me like these, like, these ways and like, you know, things that happen and I'm like, oh wow, like, I didn't even see that coming, you know? There was a moment where somebody told you that, like, you shouldn't rap. 
and they made you stop for a while. Tell me about that situation. My cousin told me one day, like, he gave me all these reasons on why, like, it wasn't really real. And, like, yo, at one point, like, I never ever believed people when they were like, yo, it's not real and da-da-da-da. But I specifically felt like it was, it was, like, real. Like, man, like, this guy's right. Like, you know, like, he's really right. And for, like, two, three days, it had me fucked up. Like, yo, it had me real fucked up. Because then I started, like, really looking at my life, like, I was already, like, you know, about to drop out. I was already, like, you know, one of those kids that was just, like, slipped through the cracks. You know what I'm saying? And I was just, like, this thing that I'm chasing that I feel like well, might make everything all right if I, you know, do capture. This thing this guy's telling me is just unreal. It's like you've been in jail or whatever, and, like, you're, they tell you there's this great escape, but you're in jail for life, and they're like, yo, there's this great escape that's going to happen in September, dog. And so you're just like, you're just like, yo, September's coming. Like, you know, every day you get mad, you're like, you know what? Whatever, dog, September's coming, this is a big escape. And then somebody comes to you like five days before the escape, like, yo, man, y'all, y'all are really gonna go do this, man. I'm telling you, man, like, this is, this is why it's not gonna work. The guard's here, he's at this point, da 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 da. But he, this guy doesn't even know if the guards are here or at this point, da, da. this is just what he believes is gonna happen. Yeah, the guards are at this point, they're at this point, you know what I'm saying? There's no way you guys are exiting. There's a fence here, it's electrical. <laughs> you fucked up, man. Congratulations, you played yourself. And you're like, damn, like, I really might not get out of here. Like, all this shit that I was thinking about, like, and you bring yourself back into the reality of, like, yo, I'm going to be stuck here. And he did that, and I was like, nah, this nigga's bugging. I remember two days later, I found my first manager. Like, after I got out of that slum, two days later, I found my first manager. And that dude took me to a point where the city knew me, and then when the city knew me, America knew me a little bit more. And then it started happening. You know what I mean? So it's just like, I don't know, man. I always think that, like, those things that, like, when people tell you, like, yo, this is not possible, or this is like, or, you know, when someone tells you something that's so earth shattering, I always feel like it's because you're so close to what, uh, you know, your purpose is that it's like, life can't give it to you that easy. It's like, nah, nigga, I need to know if you believe in this shit before I even, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not even like, you know what I'm saying? It's like selling somebody a nice ass car and it's your car, you've been loving this shit for life. And you're like, yo, are you gonna treat this good? Like, you wanna sell it, but you're like, yo, are you gonna treat this good? Cause it's like, still my baby. Like, I would like to know that it just went to the hands of a right owner or a dog or something. You're like, you know, I need to know this goes into the right hands of the owner. And like, yeah, I'm gonna treat it good, yeah, I'm gonna treat it good. And like, you know what I'm saying? And then they're getting in the car and, and he's like, his kid's crying in the back and he doesn't even care. And you're like, and you're thinking about it and you're like, ah, oh, fuck, what if this nigga doesn't really treat my shit good? Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like that, bro. Like, you know, so. <laughs> it's not such a weird ass analogy or whatever the case is, you know, but like I looked at it like that. When when somebody tells you no. Oh yeah, my bad. What so, what brings you back? Like what's what do you reach into? What do you tap into to be like, nah? Like I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm a Leo. I thrive off of progression. I say that all the time. I don't care if like this person or this guy over here is making like a million sales and I'm making such and such. If I make one more album more than I sold the last time, or if I like reach one more echelon that I didn't reach the last time, then like I succeeded. And if I just keep going like this, eventually I'm gonna come, I'm gonna get to you. It may take me a little slower, but I'm gonna get there, bro. And when I get there, I'm not gonna have to, like the thing about it is, it's like some people go like this. They come from here, they get up here, cause they just pop with whatever that thing is that made them just go real fast, right? Then there's people like me who just gotta work, gotta work, gotta work, and they work, and they work, and they get these different levels, these different levels, these different levels, these different levels, these different levels. Both of us come to a place where we're off cycle, and there's not new music dropping, and we're not dropping music videos, and we take, you know, seven months off. They're gonna fall because you didn't have no platform. You didn't, you didn't build the foundation and the steps and the levels. I have things I can fall back on. My fans are here. I didn't sat with these niggas. <laughs> we done built together. These niggas feel like I'm their brother. You know what I'm saying? Like these girls feel like I'm their boyfriend. Like this is real. Like they, my fans feel like we've grown together. Some of these guys that get on and it's like, yo, you just get this big traction because it's popping, and everyone likes you, and it's just that's cool. So you you, you take it as like, yo, I'm popping, and 
you don't think about the foundation that you have to put into it. So when it's time for us not to be here or whatever you're doing is not relevant, it's only the fans that are the core fans that still keep you up, you know? Real. That's when the authentic connection kicks in. And so you can have a hit single, but once that buzz goes down, you just drop to nothing. Exactly. Uh, tell me a little bit about your live show. The first time I saw you perform, I think it was your first show in LA, The Roxy. Uh, I didn't I didn't come in knowing I was a Tory Lanez fan, but I left being like, yo, like the energy you put in, you walked on top of the crowd from the stage to the bar. You hung from one of the railings of the bar while you were rapping, like you were giving it more than your all. Where does that come from? Is that something you're born with? Is that something you perfected over the years, your, your live show? Watching my dad as a preacher all, all plays a big part in it. Um, number one, just because like, him being a preacher, I always seen him like level out his voice and then scream when it was time for it. And like, like when when things were impactive and like, you know what I'm saying? Like me watching that and watching him with a mic growing up, I think, you know, th that that played a big part in, you know, my, my presentation on stage and, you know, my wittiness. Cause you know, my dad was one of those preachers where he's in, pre he's in church and he can deliver a message to you at the same time, but he could also take a second off and be witty for a second and make a joke. And it's just like, you know, people will laugh, but they understand what he's saying. You get what I'm saying? And because of that, you know, the the, the, the projection and the way that he spoke and um, just like his vocabulary and everything, just the way he did things was just at such a, I, I, I don't even know, just a, a, a pace and a, and, a, and a place that I feel like was just, it was inspiring to me. So now that I'm on stage and I have the mic and I'm, leading my own congregation, if you will, you know, I take things that I, I saw, you know? Have you ever had any moments on stage where you didn't have it? No, nah, I always came with the energy. The only thing is, is like, there was a couple times where like, before I started really performing, performing, that I needed to learn like how to interact with the crowd and like, you know, just things like that, that I felt like would have made my set a lot better. Um, but you know, my, ultimately, I feel like I became a great performer when I met up with this dude named Sasha and me and Sasha got together and we kind of created the way I perform, you know. Um, I genuinely, genuinely from the bottom of my heart feel like right now in this generation that we're in right now, that I have the best live show. As far as it comes to raw talent, I'm not talking about the lights and the and the fire and 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 the, all this stuff in the arena. I'm not talking about the props. I'm talking about the live show, raw, direct, live. Like, I g genuinely feel like there's nobody that can harness all the things that I do on stage or with the crowd. Like, it's weird because it's like me saying it, it's like, well, but then when you really think about it, it's like, there's some dudes that can do some of what I do. There's some people that can do this part of what I do. But there's not a lot of people that, I don't really know anybody that can do everything. When I first saw you perform, you had Love, you had Say It, and then you had Diego. And for someone who didn't know, now that I'm starting to hear your backstory, I'm able to start putting some of the pieces together. But when I first saw you, I was like, all right, in this music video, he's wearing a bucket hat, he's got a torn shirt, he looks like a backpack rapper a little bit. And then this other show, like, he's got an all-white mafioso style. I was like, I don't really fully understand, like, what his lane is, mm -hmm. but was moving around in your childhood and having all these different experiences, did that kind of, like, influence the, the different, pun intended, lanes that, that, that you took? Yeah, you know, um, for me, I just, like, I grew up watching people like Michael Jackson and like, you know, um, Missy Elliott and Busta Rhymes and just grew up seeing them be so many different characters in the videos that I always wanted to keep my own esk on things, but also not be afraid to just be different every single time. And I think that like, I kind of grew into the name Tory Lanez if it is on that level too, you know, like there's just different lanes of Tory. It, you know, no pun intended, but there's just different lanes that I could take it, and I take it through so many different lanes, but it's still authentically Tory, you know? When did your love for, for singing kick in? I was probably 16 or 17, or like, I used to suck at singing. I couldn't sing for shit, actually. But at the same time, 
I was somebody who wanted to become great at all, all of my craft. And I felt like when I was asking these dudes to sing on my songs, like nobody wanted to sing on my song because I wasn't popping. So I was like, you know what? Well, I'm gonna just teach myself how to sing and I'll sing on my own songs. And I sucked for a long time, you know what I'm saying? But I kept on singing more and more and more and more. And just like, you know, a muscle in your arm, your vocals are, uh, are, are a muscle, you know, your vocal cords are muscles. So at the end of the day, like, I just started singing more and it, it got better. And then I developed, I developed all these voices because I never had a, a vocal coach. Like I, like, so the way I was taught to sing was like, I would listen to as many singers as I, as I could and I would just try my best to do my voice like them. And I would try my, my best to make my voice how they did their voices. And because of that, it taught me how to have this deep voice that sounded like, you know, some singer over here, and then also to come back and then be able to sing so high. Like I used to listen to the Dream a lot, and when I when I used to listen to the Dream, he was always had these like high, like tropical sounding ad libs. Eh, you know what I'm saying? But it was all it, it was one of the main things that kind of helped me have that high part of my sound. Like it really came from the Dream. Like you know what I'm saying? Like me listening to um, all his records and just his albums and just going through them and hearing them. Um, the deep voice really came from like, one day I was listening to Pac and I was like, what, what separates Pac from everybody else? Like, why do I feel his music so much? And I realized it was the way he was saying things like, like, they know that those beats so, nice, the blunt telling them, just like, just like the pain in his, like, you know what I'm saying? And then that's when it caused me to start with the like, the, the Lord knows and like the, like that, that, uh, no, that comes from that. I got that from Pac. Like, that's what Pac taught me, is the projection in his voice. And it was from that point when I started looking at the projection of your voice, when I took all those voices that I had, and I just perfected the, per the projection of all those voices. So because of that, I never had one style of singing. Nobody taught me how to sing one way. I was taught, I taught myself how to sing a million ways, you know? And then I started looking at it like, I don't ever want nobody in the industry to ever feel like, like their talent is so crazy that like, that they could stunt on me and be like, yo, I'm not giving you this. Like they could, it was kind of like a, kind of like a scar from like when you're, when you're coming up and you feel like, damn, like nobody wanted to give me nothing. So you feel like, I, I'm never gonna put myself in a situation where I can't have what someone has to offer. So I was like, whatever guys have to, I'll study every single person. Study, take time, micro, look at every single way they hit the chord, every, every single thing. And I can manipulate it. And I, and I can literally make it. And because of that, when I started doing that, I started training myself to not only focus on my own sound, but to focus on every other sound. And then it was like, I need to be able to take it in every, anybody's lane that I want to take it. And that's why I'm so versatile. Because over the years, like that turned into, okay, I don't want to take it in any y'all niggas lane, actually. But all, all the great things that I've learned from all y'all. That's crazy. You became the feature you wanted to get. That's why it all sounds like I'm featuring myself on a lot of my songs. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, I need, a high, I need, a, I need some high falsetto Maxwell sounding nigga. Oh no, I can use myself. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, I've heard people call you like the hook master. When you hear something like that, like what, what does that mean to you? That's, that's an honor, man. It's an honor for anybody who um, likes my music, number one, and anybody who cares to listen to it. Um, but also like for people who just feel like, like I'm a great at this and like I'm a hook master or say something like that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like I got a special love for it because it's like, damn, like, like, like I put a lot of work into this shit. Like I be in my house every single day on the computer on that like recording myself in my house like back to back to back to back to back like i got enough songs for mad albums if i was to ever die like i just said that in an interview yesterday like somebody asked me like i have mad songs there's so many songs that just never been released that it's like yo if these there's songs that come up now and i'm like when did i record this i don't even remember the song like i don't remember whenever where or when or how so it's like for people to recognize that, it feels good. You have so many different melodies. Do you have like a certain process? I just freestyle everything. I just I stopped writing things down when it came to melody and that changed my life. 
I just started going on the mic and just singing. And just like the first thoughts that came in my head always um, are like the most uh, interesting for me and also like, you know, just the most uh, provocative for me. Like, you know, just like what, when I hear music and I hear certain beats, it's hard for you to come up with, you know, a unique style or a certain format of like making this just sound obscure and like different than anything that, you, that you've heard before, you know? And for me, I've realized that that literally comes from me at the starting when I first hear a beat. All those ideas are so incredible in my head, but then by the time I get the paper out, it's like I don't already wasted all that. So I don't even take time to listen to beats anymore. Like once I hear the first like three seconds of a beat, I'm like, all right, put me in. Because I'm scared that if I play it, I'm gonna waste all my ideas by going well, to myself before I even go in the booth. So it's like the best ideas, I just harness and save them until I get right in the booth and then I just sing. So when you get in the booth and you first hear a beat, do you just hum the melody until you get the pocket you want in? Or you actually uh, yeah, putting I, lyrics to it? No, I just say a bunch of bullshit. Shit that just doesn't make no sense. Just I'll do that, you be It'd be the dumbest shit. Like, so like, like with Liddy again, with like Liddy again, it was like, oh, <laughs> then that was like the, that was the, that was the acapella start, you know? And then it turned into, I've been raise and I bought it as Liddy again. You know what I'm saying? But it'll just start like, and then I'll start look, trying different pockets and different things and then I'll start doing like some weird like shit that like I just wouldn't like now I do this a lot like I'll do some weird shit that I just wouldn't do like I wouldn't even think about saying and I just say it in the weirdest way and then it just somehow some way just sounds so crazy that I just end up keeping it and like now I just find like these dope ass songs and melodies by doing that shit. Because a lot of people look for the words and then they try to find the pockets of how to fit those words. You're actually going for the pockets first and then you pockets. The words don't really the words don't really matter bro it's the feeling that matters. You know what I'm saying? Nobody cares about the words, man. Like all these, like they got, like little pump and Kanye West right now. Have little girls saying you're such a fucking hoe. Like that's not good. You know what I'm saying? Not to say that there's anything wrong with Kanye West or little pump, but it's like you gotta think about the power of music. Those kids aren't saying that because they really know what they're saying. Just melodically, it just sounds right. You get what I'm saying? Dun 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 dun. dun. That's a that's so catchy and then with the with the beat and the bass line like that's that's like it's crazy because that song is like the same bass line as rack city which is also like a, a amazing record right we all knew rack city was huge but because of like even similarities of things like that of just the bass line and stuff like that you don't care what the words are. That's all I was trying to say, you know? You don't care what the words are. You care about the feeling and the vibe of it and what it makes you feel like, you know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of those kids don't know what they're saying, but they care about the song because it just sounds good, you know? Yeah, it's scary in a way. Cause it's very scary. It's like, I just say that because I have a son and like, I'm thinking like, you know what I'm saying? Like, damn, like, like how do I shield him? But then I don't want to shield him because it's the world and, you know, you don't ever want to encase anything like because, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's your child. And, you know, you, I, I always want my child to grow up how I grew up in a weird way. Like, I want him to learn values and I don't want him to always feel like I'm going to come to his rescue. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I want him to also understand a sense of, of independence for himself because that's also what my dad taught me. How has having a son shaped you? Um, honestly, it's weird because it's like I didn't. It wasn't one of those things where like, people were like, yo, when you have this kid, it's gonna just change your whole life and you're just gonna start looking at life. Like, that never happened to me, guys. I'm sorry, it just, that, that didn't happen. But what did happen is as my son gets older, right? And as he begins to form words and begins to form real emotion for things that he can see and he can understand and like, and that I can understand that he's actually forming emotion for, now that that is in play, it makes me like more so how, feel how I felt. I didn't feel like different when he was like born or like I didn't cry or like all this. Like, I don't know. I, like, you know, me and my baby mother were laughing. Like uh, I was cracking jokes. It was just really weird. I don't know how she was doing it. She was cracking jokes with me like five minutes before he was born. He was born in like, I swear he was born in like three minutes. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just came out, he was chilling. And it wasn't like, I don't know, I didn't feel like, you know, it's just now that as he gets older, 
I start to look at it like, all right, he's starting to understand things and like he's starting to repeat things. And like this is when it's starting to matter, like the things that I'm going to tell him, you know, are going to really actually mean something to him because he's going to take them and he's going to say them until they, they actually become real to him, you know. Now you're at a point where you see that things are actually shaping him. It's like, I've heard that some people are like, yeah, baby's born and they feel different. But a lot of people, it's like once they turn two, three, four, when they start talking, walking, acting like you, sharing things that they learned in school, whatever, that's when you're like, oh, like I have yeah. to protect them or I have to influence like I got them. Yeah, exactly. Like, because then you got to think about all the things that they learn in school and not every not everybody's view is is the same as yours. I'm not saying any, everybody else's view is wrong, but not everybody's view is the same. And, um, you know, in this world moving at the rate that it's moving at, you know, the attention span of kids not being uh, the way it used to be, it's like, you know, it's only so much that your kid can really handle as far as like on a day to day basis or so the amount of stuff that he's seeing and the amount of things that he's taking in. It's only so much that you could even curate and be like, yo, don't watch this and don't watch this. Like the world has turned into a place where it's like it's things are just everywhere. Like you just. You just, nigga, you go on Cartoon, tar cartoon Network, nigga, you might see some crazy shit. Like, you just, shit is just crazy. So, it, it comes to a place where now, you now have to look at your children and be like, you know, like I said, you have to ask yourself the deciding decision. Like, do I let him go out into the world or do I, you know, try to shield him? And then it's even worse for guys like me because it's like, do I let him go to public school knowing that his dad is me or do I send him to private school but then he's gonna he might be a brat and at the end of the day it's like yo I can't have him around those brats because I wasn't a brat like you dig what I'm saying no matter who my dad was so it's like but at the same time it's like but then do I bring him to public school where it's like I'm a rapper and some you know, some things could happen to him and like, you know, it's like, ah, it's like you don't, you don't really know. But that's because the world is the place that it is now. You know, things come with time and, you know, as you get older, I'm sure, you know, you make the right decisions and you just say either like, all right, fuck it, man, I'm sending him to public school, man, or I'm sending him, you know, to private school or whatever, you know, maybe this is just best for him and I got to stop thinking about what I had as a, you know? That's real. It's crazy. I don't even have a kid and I think about that all the time because I'm like, my struggle is what made me who I am. I'm like, if this kid, I mean. Like how, but how is he gonna struggle like that? It's right. like, I can't let him struggle like that. There's no way I can have him in the house fighting niggas. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like, I can't have this kid growing up like me. You know what I'm saying? Like, but then I realized like, you know, there's just other ways that, that you can learn that. Like, you know, if, if my dad, um, my dad is a very incredible person to me, but you know, when I was younger, like maybe if, if he wasn't always traveling or like, you know, had other things to do, Maybe there would have been, he taught me so many principles, but maybe there would have been a little bit more principles that maybe I would have known or maybe I would have, you know, went with it. Maybe there was just a different way of me learning certain things opposed to me having to, you know, get to a certain place with certain people to, to learn. Um, and I look at my son the same way, like maybe if I just teach him the principles from early and, you know, put him in boxing class, you know what I'm saying? Like, so he knows how to throw his duke up if he has to opposed to like him having to live with these guys who's just gonna like you know what i'm saying like so it's like yeah it's the same thing it's like you know your upbringing is how you were raised and that why you got to the place you are and, you know you got to decipher how much of that you show your child and how harsh of reality you give to your child when it comes to that let's talk a little bit about the new album there's a line in there in miami where you talk about smoking is the only way you find peace oh yeah um i said the only time i feel at peace is when i'm dumb huh Cause and people ask me why I smoke so many blunts. Um, I'm a very avid smoker, um, you know, but I'm also somebody who kind of fights against it at the same time. Like I kind of go through like a a conflict of like, you know, just like I think a lot of people who fight addictions and things that they got going on in their life. And really, what it comes down to is like it's really a mental awareness thing, right? And it's like, you know, when you say mental awareness, everyone's like, oh, mental awareness, oh, shut up. But in all reality, it's like, it's a mental awareness thing. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just aware of the fact that, like, sometimes I could be dependent on weed. And to the point where it's like, maybe if I wasn't so dependent, I'd be able to find peace by just, like, finding something that balances me out. But because I've, I've been dependent on weed so long, and I smoke back to back. So it's like, I find the peace in, in relaxing and going, 
You know what I'm saying? When I'm mad. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know if it's maybe the act of smoking or if it's the feeling, but I don't really get high like that no more because I smoke so much. So it's like, I feel like it takes me a certain amount of like weed for me to just feel like, I. I think we live in a society where it's hard to find peace, especially as an artist. That I think that even accentuates it because you're constantly around people. People expect you to put on a certain persona in front of the cameras and all that. So I, like when I heard that line, I was like, man, this reminds me of, of Mac. You know, he had to resort to certain things to, to find his peace and whatever inner demons he was going through. It's not something you necessarily always, through the music you can, but it's not necessarily something you want to share with the world. Mm. That's why when I heard that song, I was like, man, like I, I want to talk about this. I feel like there isn't necessarily a lot of platforms for artists to be able to, to talk about mental awareness. No, nah, it's, it's, it's mental awareness. Honestly, like I, I think that our whole generation is, isn't as mentally aware as, as we should be. You know what I'm saying? Like the behavior of a lot of people in this day and age, they're mental health problems. Like, they're, they're like mental disorders. It's not like, nah, this guy's just stupid. Nah, the thing about it is when you say mental awareness, people think like, um, you know, somebody that's in a special ed class or somebody that, you know, has, has a disability or like, you know, uh, somebody has Down syndrome or like, you know, people, people think in this weird way when it's like no mental awareness. It's, it's like literally just like, why you do certain things, you know, why your habits are a certain way, why do you react to things. Maybe you're really actually mad about some shit that you just don't even know that you're mad about, so you take it out on in this certain way where every time you see somebody you laugh a certain way, or, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just with things that like if you were mentally aware you would know, okay, this is why I do this. So, you know, maybe I could stop doing X, Y, Z for the result of A, B, C to happen, you know, um, but there's not enough of that, there's not a lot of that, and so like, you know, I encourage everybody who's watching this, like, to, like, always check on your mental, like, health and, like, your state of mind, at least, you know. And that's something, like, I had to learn. I learned recently, you know, from my baby mother. She was the, the first person who really came here and was like, yo, you know, why do you always da-da-da-da? And maybe, like, it really comes down to, and she kind of really broke it down because she's somebody who really pays attention to a lot of that stuff. And she really broke it down to me and was just like... Maybe the reason why you go at this is because it's something that has to do with da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da and then, you know... Just things like that, like I've, I've learned, you know. For people watching who are like, all right, I want to check my mental awareness, what steps would you uh, would you recommend? Like, what will work for you? Um, I mean, it depends about, about going to, like, you know, the extremes or not. I mean, I think that you could go to, like, therapy, you know, with somebody who's, like, who understands, who really is going to understand. And, like, you know, even, the, like, people do neurology and stuff like that as well, like, for your brain. And, like, because there's real, there's real actual, like, things that happen in our brains that we don't even understand like and it's like yo you feel this way because like yo you did some shit and your brain received it as you know what I'm saying and like the thing is it's like if you know those things you can stop those things like you know what I'm saying a lot of people don't have to be depressed they just they're, they're going to the doctor for all these things I feel this way da 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 and it's not it's not always the doctor it's somebody who handles mental health and mental like awareness like it's not it's not the, 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 the doctor who's going to cure you for a cough. That guy is just like you and me. You know what I'm saying? He just got his degree and you know what I'm saying? That doesn't make him uh, expert in brain science or nothing like, you know what I'm saying? Or if you want to take it a little further, you know, there's certain um, treatment centers and stuff like that where you can actually go learn. Like you, you go for 30, 30 days, it kind of feels like rehab, but at the end of the day, like, you know, you're not in a straitjacket. Like, you know, they, they just kind of talk to you and stuff like that. Like, they got one in Arizona. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of spots, you know, there's a lot of places that you can go check on your health mentally. I'm glad you taking the time to talk about it because I feel like for so long in hip hop, like talking about depression, talking about it, it was just so taboo. It's like everybody always had to be like indestructible. And I feel like now the new generation is kind of like, hey, like it's okay to be sad, it's okay to be depressed, it's okay to do all this stuff. Like, I think everybody has emotions. Um, you know, for a long time, the game, especially just like with like urban, like hip hop and stuff, everybody's thing was like this back in the day, you know what I'm saying? And like now that there's a lot of, and it sucks to say it like this, but now there's a lot of more, you know, drug influence on a lot of the kids too. There's a lot more depressive things coming out, sad music, um, music that people feel like, yo, I can relate to this because I be feeling the same way that this guy feels when he says he pops three Zans in the morning and he da 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 da, you know what I'm saying? And like because of that, there is a wide uh, dosage of kids that are coming down every day. You know what I'm saying? That feel like, yo, I'm depressed today. 
I want to listen to some sad music. I want to drown in my feelings. You know what I'm saying? But I think that that all, like I said, it all comes from a state of like your mental and like understanding where you are mentally, you know? Um, so I feel like we've been talking about a lot of serious stuff. This album that you just put out, it's actually a much lighter album. Like, it feels like it's a vibe. Is that kind of reflective of where you are with, with your life right now? I didn't want to go about, like, all my albums. Like, they're just, like, these albums. Like, you know, like, when you put the word album there, it's like, yo, I got to go about this, like, Jay-Z's first album. Like, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, nah, I, I got to go about this, like, how I want to go about this, bro. And I just got to feel good doing it. And that's what this album was about. It was like... I started creating these records that I just felt good about, like, ah, like, ah, yeah, like, you know? And because of that, it made me just want to make more, more, more records like that, and we started creating this project that sounded so uh, musical, and it just sounded like, like you said, like, it was a vibe, but it was also the first time that I just felt like my music was just, like, in just pure color. Like, I like, you know, there's certain people in life that um, they hear music in color. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pharrell is one of those people. John Legend's one of those people. From what I heard, I might be wrong, no, you're right. but and and it's like this thing where they see music in color and like my my nephew has it. He'll listen to music and like when music is perfectly in tune, it's like you'll see like like you'll see him just kind of stuck like and he, it's like but if someone hits a pitch off, it's like it's like it fucks with him like you know what I'm saying? He sees it in color. Like he'll say it like yo, I see, you know, I see it in color like, and there's only certain people that that had that and I felt like this music was colorful mm. you know I, I felt like I seen the music in color for the first time and not because I wasn't spitting or or I wasn't you know doing something that I didn't do on the last album or anything like that it just it just felt colorful tell me a little bit about I mean I don't want to call it near-death experience but it sounded like from from when I was hearing you talk about it Take me back to that place. You're in a plane, all of a sudden, sudden it starts dropping. Like, what's going through your mind? I was one of those dudes who's like always been like, like the plane goes like this. I'm like, like you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm one of those scared dudes. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna lie. Like, I'm very scared of like, not anymore as as much as I used to be, but like, grew up very like, I don't like heights and I don't like feeling like it's uncontrollable when I'm that high in the air because I don't like that feeling of dropping. The autopilot shut off like at 39,000 feet and went down to 11,000 feet in a minute and 30 seconds. Holy shit. Yeah. And we caught the autopilot, reconnected at 11,000 feet. If there was 30 more seconds, we'd have been dead. So like the plane and like when we were going down into turbulence, we fell into like a category three storm, which is also like what made our plane go down even faster. So it was just like, he was there. We was all. It was. It was scary, bro. It, it was like, yeah, we was. It was scary. It was scary, man. You know what I'm saying? Does your mind have room for any other thoughts, or you're just like, oh shit, am I gonna die? Does like, do you start thinking about like, like I was praying to God, and I just kept saying for some reason, I was like, I know I'm not going. I know you. I know I'm not going out like this. Like I kept saying to myself, like I know you're not gonna let me go out like this. Like I know you. Like this is not what you have planned for me. Like I know this is not my fate. I just kept saying it and I was just like, like, God, you have the plane, like you're protecting the plane right now. And as, as much as it got scarier and scarier to say that, each time it kept dipping and dipping and going lower, I just had to keep saying it, like, yo, you got the plane, like, have faith, you have the plane, like, it just caught, it caught back at 11,000 feet, dog. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It caught right back at 11,000 feet, like. So the plane catches back, then what's going through your head? I was just thinking about my son. It's just like, yo, like, how am I gonna, just never gonna see him again, like, you know what I'm saying? Just going down. Just felt like, yo, he was gone, like, he was about to die, like, it was bad, like, yo, it was bad. It was bad, it was real bad. And then I remember I got off stage, I had a panic attack, and I started to perform at Summer Jam, so I was, like, performing at Summer Jam, and, like, my whole chest was just, like, tight, and I couldn't breathe. So you got off the plane and had to perform right away? And then run straight to Summer Jam. Damn. That was where I was trying to get there so fast for. On the flight here, we were in some turbulence that was crazy. Like it just felt like, the, like I felt like I was about to jump in the same. It's just fucked up now. Cause now every time I get into turbulence, I think like the real situation is about to happen again. Like, so it's just like you know. It's dope that you're able to find a positive in it. Yeah, it is what it is. It made the project, and you know the project went number one. You work with with Mika on the album. Are you also working on another project with him? Or? Yeah, we've been working on a little collab, little little tape. Um, we just got to lock in just to kind of piece everything together. Me. 
Chris, we've been working on one too. I want to create like this little project side series where it's like my world to your world, like five, six, seven songs with an artist, and we just throw them out, like, you know? What is it about Meek in particular that makes you guys click up so much? We've been making music for years. Meek was on one of my first mixtapes. Um, he was on a Swavy tape, and we just been making music for years, like just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Just never stop. Wayne's about to jump on uh, on a remix, or did jump on a remix? Yeah, yeah. What was that like? I ain't gonna lie, Wayne killed it. He skated on everything. Um, he just like, he came with one of them old classic Wayne verses, like when he used to come on the songs and just remix them, like, even hit me with the remix, baby, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's fire, it's fire. Um, about to clear it and it's about to come out. Well, you actually put out a song with Asuna earlier in the in the year. Yeah. How did you start dabbling into the, the Latin space? Well, I live in Miami. Um, I'm sorry not to cut you off. I live in Miami. Um, you know, everything's tropical. It's a lot of palm trees around. Um, very Latin influence um, culture. You know what I'm saying? I'm always at the Cuban spot. You know what I mean? Getting a steak pie meal. You know what I mean? And I'm just one of those dudes where I, I, I remember one time I was with Ray. This was my assistant, this dude over here. I don't want to show him because he's just ugly. But no, nah, just playing. But um, I remember like it was an urban club. You know, everybody's all kind of people in there black people, Spanish, white. He played the remix to this song. I think Ozuna was on. To this day, I still don't even know the words. But it was the melody, and everybody in the club was singing this. Like everybody, like. What was it? I remember hearing the song and looking around and being like, I was like, yo, this kid kind of sounds like me a little bit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is like some stuff that I would do, but that melody's so crazy. And then I look at around the club and I'm like, yo, I want to do this. I want to do this because I have so many Spanish fans that sometimes they don't understand everything that I'm saying. Like in my slangs and like all this extra, but they just like the vibe. So I'm like, why am I not gonna have something that I can give back to them that they feel like, I right, Tori, Tori care about it because he took the time to make music just for me to listen to. You feel me? And also it's like, I really like it. Like I really like the music that comes out of like Latin America right now, it's crazy. Like you feel me? Like it's, it's really crazy. So for me it's like, I don't ever want to feel or ever try to be like a culture vulture or one of those dudes who does something because it's popping like I've been been said this before like Bad Bunny was out like you know what I'm saying like talking to Ray about setting this up and setting this doing all this extra stuff and we made the project like so long ago it's just like right now we're finishing it up El Agua is the name of the project we're finishing it up um, but Ozuna was the first person who heard that first song, and it's crazy because the way I learned like to talk like Spanish or to sing Spanish, because I can't really talk it that fluently, like really at all. But I could read it really well, and I could I could write it well. So uh, when I, when I first made the song, I learned all those words off of Duolingo, right? Duolingo is like this app, and those were like some of the first words that I learned. Um, which that's why the hook was so simple. It was Lo siento, mamacita, esta noche. You know what I mean? That's why it was so simple because those were like, you know, Lo siento, esta noche. Like these were the first couple of words that I learned. So I made it into a song, and it just ended up going. Like you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it really ended up going. And then um, I had to like bring like um, shout out to Saba and Los. But I had to bring like two two of my dudes that are Spanish as well, like to come in and actually like listen and proof hear a lot of the stuff that I'm saying. And like sometimes I have to be like, yo, how do I say, you know, this, that, and the third? Um, or like I come with like, cause I always come with all the melodies. That's off top. I come with the melodies like, yo, but I want to say da 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 da. And then like they'll tell me a line, and then I'll think about something that I've already read that I could like uh, either rhyme it with or like you know what I'm saying. So it was like, it was really like. Um, a group effort as well. Like, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, yo. I'm... Yeah, I was gonna ask, I was like, are you bilingual in Spanish? Like, how'd you even like? No, I, mean, I, could, I could read it well, you know, and I could read it well, I could sing it well. Like, when I, when I, when my accent, when I sing it is incredible, like, I know how to pronunciate everything. Like, I don't sound like some American dude on Google Translate. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, Pa Me was my first, the first time, like, I, I made like a full song in Spanish. That was the first song that I made. 
in full like like you know in full Spanish. So me getting a plaque off of that and like things that happened off of it, I didn't expect it. I was just trying to do something. But as I made more and more Spanish music, like I became really fluent with it. Like so now I'm like really fluent with singing it and like writing it. You know. It's crazy that Asuna was the first person you worked with because to me he's the hook master of Latin music. So for for you guys to like work together, I was like, yo, it's just it makes sense. Nah, it's fire. Tell me a little bit more about that. I'm like, who else have you worked with? Like what? Um, Ozu is on it. Uh, Nicky Jam is on it. Um, we're still drawing for a lot of other features, but uh, Darrell is on it. Um, I went back and got Nina Sky. Uh, um, just to do some classic like you know stuff on it as well. Um, Right now we try and get uh, Maluma and J Balvin and Yankee and you know um, a couple other people. So we're just waiting on a couple features, and if we don't, then we just we're gonna put it out regardless, you know. But that's why I called the project Alagua because I felt like you know a lot of my songs they still kind of feel a little bit. Um, they're not like urban like Latin songs. They're not like you know hip hop Latin songs. They're more so songs that you can hear by the water, like that you want to listen to on an island, that you want to listen to on a boat, or you want to hear on a country or like I, I, in, a, in a place that's surrounded by water, you know? So that's why I called it the water, like El Agua. So I thought it was El Agua because you have different lands so you're able to like move in between. <laughs> that's a dope way of thinking about it. Being Latino myself, like I felt like Spanish music was kind of like marginalized in a way and like you wouldn't hear it necessarily on the like hip hop stations per se. It's like you could turn on the reggaeton station and you would hear these artists. Mm -hmm. But now there seems to be a little bit more of you can hear more hip hop artists on the Latin side and now you hear more Latin artists on, on the hip hop side. Like how do you as an artist, how do you feel about how cultures are mixing right now and sounds are mixing? I think it's great, man. You know what I'm saying? I think it's always great for music to be diverse. You know, music was meant to be shared. Um and I just think that, you know, at this point of our lives, like it's only so long that we have to create and innovate, you know. Everybody gets old one day. Um, you know, they forget everybody's songs one day, you know. And at the end of the day, like, while we're here, like, let's let's be the innovators of music that, that clashed. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, when this touched this and it became this, you know what I mean? Like, I'm all for being, like, the innovators of that. You're on a remix with Teflon Don, too, that's pushing yeah. a slightly different sound. Yeah, shout out to Steph. Tell me a little bit about that. I was in London, and I hit her up, and she was like, yo, you out here? I'm like, yeah, I'm out here. And I'm like, yo, let's get some records done. She sent me the record. I did the record, We shot, and I was like, yo. I remember texting, I was like, yo, if you're really, like a, like, a real, real, real one, We'll shoot the video tomorrow. Cause I only had like three days in town. I was like, we'll shoot the video tomorrow. Cause I just made it and I was like, yo, if you're a real one, we'll shoot the video tomorrow. And she was like, all right. And we really shot the video the next day. Like we really shot the video the next day. And then it went out. <laughs> you got a track with uh, with A Boogie dropping on Friday, right? Yeah. You wanna talk right. about that at all? Yeah, the video's gonna be dropping on Friday. Um, I directed it myself. Um, I shoot with a dude named Mid and a dude named Zach. Um, so between us three, we do all the videos. Like for everybody who doesn't know, like all of our videos are facilitated through us. Um, I edit them too. But Zach is on. this one. Yeah. Everything that's been coming out, like. It's you. I'm out here. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mid is also out here. Zach is also out here. And we all together kind of just do what we do, you know? And um, the video's dope. We shot it in like this, like arcade kind of stage theater weird kind of thing is kind of fire but it's also like a recap of a of um a video that we put out um previous me and a boogie called best friend so it's like kind of picks up from where that one left off i saw another video the one with miki kind of had a little, a little tip of the hat to, to jay with the changed clothes kind of seemed like it you were yeah, just kind of playing on watch yeah that was the whole point like i wanted i literally um, and I edited that one. I edited Drip Drip. So like for me, even when in the editing, like I had to keep going back to his shots and like seeing like how they did it. Like you know, what I'm saying like certain things um, we nailed it in certain things. It's like you know, I, I didn't want to like you know copy it all the right. way. You know what I'm saying? That's an homage. But like you know, like the the moment when Beans, remember when Beans came out, like I you know I had Fat Boy do it, and then like you know the red carpet intro when he's like you coming in and he's like yeah no, nope. you know what I'm saying like that that stuff. You know I I try to keep a 
change clothes theme to keep it like classic like some something that i liked and enjoyed growing up do you up. see like directing as something that you're like interested in like something that you want to keep doing or is it just more yeah no I lo- no i love directing um i'm in love with everything just being cinematic man i love like cinematic shots and like editing and like knowing that like you know the cards dumping and i'm like i i love all that like you know what i'm saying any last words i'm ready to go man i just want to let all my fans know that like you know i'm uh, i've been away for a minute and um the pieces are back realigned and i think that you know this time over all the times is, is going to be the most crazy out of everything that's happened previous you know and i just feel like my fans need to just understand that I'm motivated and I'm in a place where I'm not going to stop like at, on any kind of levels like I'm about to take this to a whole different level so bear with me so I appreciate you taking the time great interview man